Is this okay? कैमरा ऑन करना है क्या? मैं सुनीता आई वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर सेशन फोर बी of the six six conference it's on air pollution and climate change sustainable approaches we have our distinguished uh, session moderators dr nindi lakshendra and dr priyali das uh, we have uh, the panelists in this session dr rakesh kumar dr s kashima Dr. Sumit Sharma, Mrs. Padma Rao, Dr. Alta Hussain Khan, and Nimish Singh. Now I am going to introduce the session moderators, uh, Dr. Nitin Lakshetwar. Dr. Nitin Lakshetwar is a PhD in chemistry. With 35 years of research experience in environmental and energy related research he worked as sta jsps fellow and visiting overseas researcher at nims japan and as a visiting professor at kyushu university japan under the global coe program on novel carbon resource sciences he has also worked at other international laboratories to develop materials and processes including low cost and nano materials or catalysts for their applications in automobile emission control ghg emission control cleaner energy generation etc he has worked on 70 research publication With over six AOO citations and H index of 44 and 22 international patents, in addition to a few contributions in books, he has also worked on refinement as well as other projects for emission control from in-house and other vehicles. He is an identified expert. for the cpcb of india now i am going to introduce dr priyali das dr das is a senior fellow and area convener in the advanced biofuel division at terry and an adjunct professor in terry school of advanced studies she is co pit in dpt terry national Center of Excellence in Biofuels and Biocommodities. She obtained PhD in Energy Systems Engineering from IIT Bombay and 2.6 years of postdoctoral research experience at University of South California, USA. She has over eight patents granted to her credit as a lead inventor, four under process, 16 papers in international journals. and five book chapters she is working on several national and international industry funded projects and led over 20 projects as pi and copi now i hand over the floor to dr nitin lakshetwar for the further proceedings thank you dr sumita for the kind words and a very very good afternoon and welcome to this uh, session 4b on uh, air pollution and climate change sustainable approaches i welcome you all along with uh, dr priyali das who will be moderating so uh, just a very quick a few words that the climate change has become probably the most uh, serious challenge humanity has ever faced 
not only environmental challenge, but the challenge we have ever faced. Obviously, it's a challenge which is fairly complex, dealing with almost all the walks of life and dealing with uh, practically everything around us. However, many countries, including India, is also facing the double whammy of uh, climate change as well as air pollution. And to understand these complex uh, problems and to find uh, appropriate solutions, we definitely need uh, experts of uh, evidence. And we also have experts uh, like Dr. Rakesh Kumar, Dr. Sarvi, Dr. Subin, uh, Dr. Padma Rao, Dr. Adhisen Khan, and Dr. Dimit Singh with us. So, without taking more time, I would like to <clears throat> invite uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar to a very uh, brief introduction of uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar, who is uh, well known to this uh, fraternity. He is a former director of uh, CSN Needy, and uh, he has done his master's in environmental sciences and injury from IIT Bombay and got, later got PhD in environmental engineering. He is a visiting adjunct professor at uh, CESC IIT Bombay and visiting faculty to Excel University. He is uh, actually affiliated to many academics and uh, research organizations of prestige. His main area of expertise is the development of appropriate technology for environmental quality improvement, encompassing the field of air pollution, hazardous waste management, wastewater treatment, and so on and so forth. Initiated many areas. He has uh, credit to initiate many areas of research related to climate change and health, urban microclimate, specific source apportionment, retrofitment, uh, retrofitment nature of solutions for solving real life environmental problems. Some of the notable awards conferred on him are environmental leadership awards by US Asia Environmental Partnership and US Aid for the 2005 for his outstanding contributions in improving quality of life for the population of Asia. He has uh, also been given many awards, uh, including the prestigious Bonspick Award 2012, Yoshi Think of Ecology Award 2015, Trans Asia Chamber of Commerce for Industry, Environmental Protection 2017, to name a few. Uh, he has uh, a long list of uh, achievements. He has handled a very large number of projects across the globe. And uh, we are fortunate to have a, distinct, a distinguished person like Dr. Yakesh Kumar. So, I will uh, once again formally welcome you, Dr. Akish Kumar, and uh, request you to please. Sure. Thank you. As uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar has to leave for another talk, uh, I request the audience, if you have some quick question after his uh, brief presentation, we can take up the questions right away. Thank you, Dr. Nitin, uh, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, all the other panelists, uh, Dr. Piali Das, and everyone else, uh, distinguished people who are sitting here. Uh, this is a topic which is uh, of concern me, uh, to, to me individually as well as when we look at nationally and internationally. So I'll try to bring a small perspective of what is that we are talking about. And uh, the reason why I want to speak on this uh, in a very different way is also this that we have bracketed certain topics. Uh, which we talk about here, like climate change, health, and air pollution, in three different baskets. And of course, we, we also add multiple baskets of water pollution, and then biodiversity, and, and microclimate, and everything else. The reason why I'm just choosing this three here, just to highlight that if we keep talking about them individually, in, in separate, separate uh, uh, silos, chances are that we'll miss the bus in terms of understanding the whole thing. And that's what I thought I'll highlight uh, here a few things which are very critical for all of us here. So uh, uh, a recent paper that we published, uh, uh, Dr. Hemant is also here, uh, where we talked about value burden of measure modality and a lot of calls came that, uh, oh, is this a very serious matter? Uh, tell us what out of these out of these air pollution, how many of them are impacting more and how many are doing it less? So it's basically doing some kind of granulation to a level where people will not be very, very comfortable after a point. But what is important here is that if we have to take action on the ground, it will be essential that uh, we, we do all of it together. Okay. 
So uh, in India specifically, when we are looking at the issues of air pollution, we have now national clean air program. Apparently, it appears that it has been comprehensive enough and it will be able to deal with all of these issues. Uh, and that's what it is important for uh, the experts here to examine all of them in the Now, what is important here to see in this uh, particular slide that each and every component here is actually integrated. So if I'm if I'm talking about uh, air pollution alone, I will only be touching a small surface. But when, when I talk about environment and health issues which are in, which are connected with climate change, I'll have air pollution, we'll have inadequate water sanitation, we'll have chemical related issues, we have radiation, uh, we have noise related issues and other occupational issues as well. So here in this case, if you see on, on, on the right hand side, climate change comes as a smaller component. Uh, by the way, when, when we look at as this as a, a smaller component, it is not that it is doing less or it is doing more. In fact, when we take all of them together, any one of them may be doing more and we, we really need to understand it more better as we go ahead. The other one which you see and why I am trying to show these two uh, diagram is that these are very dynamic ones. We should not be looking at and then saying this is what is the gospel truth. Uh, here you see the first the first item which is looking like uh, top 10 causes of death from the environment. Uh, stroke, the second one is in heart diseases, third one is uh, relating to unintentional injuries, fourth one is cancer and fifth one is chronic respiratory disease and so on and so forth. What is important here is that now people are able to figure it out that air pollution could be contributing to all of these four five. So if I have to if, if I have to divide these into multiple parameters and say which one is causing more, it is actually not helping me out. I need to understand the source first and then address that source rather than getting into those smaller numbers, then which one is contributing more and therefore we keep debating without solving the problem. So when you look at climate change, health and air pollution, this nexus, because it's the topic of, of this panel, uh, we all know carbon dioxide and that is what we have discussed. But what is also equally important, all other greenhouse gases, because most of the communication these days uh, are not happening in that direction. We have become carbon, carbon, carbon. We have forgotten about other five CNG gases. Of course, they, they can be converted into CO2 equivalent. But what actually happens is the moment we have heating of atmosphere, all of these interconnectedness can be seen because all our system gets disturbed. And some of them I'll uh, highlight a little later as we go ahead. One of the easiest things to understand is the moment you have higher temperature, uh, your air behaves differently. And of course, uh, biological systems also they start be behaving uh, you know, differently. So the easiest one which everyone knows that when we have these temperature changes, you have high allergens, we have hard flare. And many a times uh, we would have direct impact, like uh, you, you get flu kind of symptoms, uh, which is almost similar to COVID symptoms that we are talking about these days. But over a period of time, those people who are affected for a longer period, they can, they can be highly sensitive towards it. And this is a complaint which Indian subcontinent people uh, find it much more common. One is that all the time in your uh, throat, you have, you have some kind of discomfort. We, in Hindi, we call it kras. And it actually happens because of the high ozone level, uh, which, is, which is there in the atmosphere. Over a period of time, your inner liner inside of your throat uh, gets eroded or corroded. And that's why you have all the time this feeling that you, are, you have a cough, but you don't have a cough. So if you, if you take medicine, nothing happens. So ground level ozone, which is which is a big component, and uh, if you see the all the conversation in our country, still we haven't been talking about this so much, uh, except that our particulate matter is so predominant uh, that all our air quality index is driven by particulate matter. But however, this small concentration of ozone could be actually creating more trouble uh, in terms of health damages. The other thing which is again not captured so very well and I'm, I'm sure the panel will discuss and debate about it. The moment you have been 1 to 2 degree average temperature rise due to climate change, you have less soil moisture. And the moment you have so less soil moisture, you will have dust storms. And more and more dust will be outside uh, in the air. And it will be so fine that it's not settling on its own. These are not coarse particles. So over a period of time, you see the visibility issue, the place where we are in. Uh, even in Lucknow right now, you can see that it's not settling type of particulate matter. And that along with other pollutants can be creating a cocktail which is very difficult to deal with. Sustained forest fires which you cannot douse very easily. 
and uh, even even very developed countries are unable to douse their forest fires. Uh, in our country, we need to be more worried about it because this is much more serious. This slide I just wanted to uh, highlight here for, for two different regions. Uh, this is top global ranks in terms of impacts people talk about. So the first one for 2021 is talking about infectious diseases, then you have climate action, third one is because of mass destruction for the biodiversity, uh, so on and so forth. The last one, livelihood crisis. And, and I would say although it is appearing seventh, uh, but in our country, in our subcontinent, it should probably the first. Why I'm saying that is, the moment you want to control air pollution or you want to control, uh, uh, say, climate change, driving uh, certain other forces, which are basically nothing but combustion processes, uh, you are you are talking about impacting poor. So the moment I say biomass burning should be stopped so that you don't have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and therefore climate change and therefore air pollution, you are actually directly hitting the poor. And a, and a country like ours where you have very high population, which is almost like 70-75% of the population, which is poor and which is highly impacted due to uh, uh, the energy security related issues, uh, we cannot be ignoring it. So when we have this conversation of climate change, air pollution and health, livelihood for our context becomes the priority number one. In fact, so this is of course in terms of health when we are talking about it should be there, but we need to look at this as important. This is another very interesting slide that I wanted to share with you. Uh, this is from, from a different angle. Uh, I had a panel in uh, Europe in uh, Indian, Indian standards where we are looking at environmental services related parameters. And what we find is the maximum money which is getting, getting spent is on hazardous waste. Right? After that is water supply, then is wastewater, environmental science, nuclear waste. Air quality and clean energy comes almost seventh. Climate change doesn't still level figure out. But what is important here to notice is that each of the above is actually interlinked with climate change. So even if I don't say it, actually it is interlinked. I don't need to highlight it, re-highlight it all over again. But what is what is important here is where the money is getting spent. The purpose of this uh, this particular PPT is to understand that money has to be allocated in a nice manner so that you are allocating where the money is needed. So if I am addressing something which is not leading to the large benefit to the poorest of poor people in our country, we are missing the bus and therefore uh, we will not see the benefit that we have, we have been wanting. So lastly, uh, as a panel, I wanted to uh, put some questions and some, some thoughts that what is that India can do? So the first thing which I, I, I assume and which was also very evident during COVID time that current health infrastructure is not even enough uh, to, to take care of regular day-to-day -day diseases. And I mean it. Even in today's situation when COVID was not there, if you want to find out a bed in any hospital or clinic, it's a task. So if I am talking about climate change induced health issues, I am talking about air pollution, I need to have more and more clinics which is there for identification and prevention and which can also be advised with what is that you can do before you go to the clinic. Uh, I, I, I think we need a whole set of uh, population which, can, which could possibly be trained that how to advise people not to be prepared to go to hospital or clinic. The second set of people is that we teach them what are those diseases which are coming in a very different ways uh, where we call it medical professionals are still not aware. Uh, which are the ones which is coming because of air pollution, which is because of climate change, which is because of climate induced uh, health. And the third one which is interconnected is all the poor uh, paramedics and uh, support staffs which are required. So uh, very, very back of the developed calculation if you do, it looks like we will need at least five times of current strength uh, medical professional uh, that we have in our country. At least five times of the strength that we have. The second thing in terms of priority is this very important that each of the area or each of the place in our country will not be impacted so much. But uh, now we have uh, enough data, we have enough climate models available which we can uh, downscale to find out which are my hotspot in the country where I need to worry about more. And hotspot I mean uh, it could be sensitive to the receptors, sensitive location and the people concerned who are living there. And lastly, identify and integrate all of these disciplines, including medical sciences, uh, which is difficult, 
Uh, many of you sitting here also know that chemistry, uh, as the simplest of subject, is also divided into four different disciplines, sub-disciplines. Uh, climate change even more difficult and more more complex. So in this case, uh, we need all kind of professionals to work together, and that is how we will be able to solve this problem. So uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me, and uh, look forward to if there are any questions on this. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar, for your brief but very comprehensive uh, introduction of this problem and setting the tone of this panel discussion. So, we can take up a few questions who are presented here, or if there are questions online, because Dr. Rakesh Kumar has to view for an hour. Please, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chief, for the uh, excellent uh, comprehensive, comprehensive uh, lecture. Uh, I believe that uh, there are several issues related to the climate and climate stresses, not only really people's stresses. Uh, they suggesting some different types of the mitigation strategies uh, also. Uh, what, uh, what exactly technological angles the government of India is doing, or India is doing in this direction, that I like to because uh, without this te uh, technology, uh, I, I don't think that uh, the problem one can solve the problem. Uh, mayor saying something uh, and talking more and also in public and all these things. I'm not going to, I think that uh, they are not going to solve the problem. So I like your comments, the government angles that they are taking because you are very close to government agencies. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank you for this question. And this is very uh, complex to answer as, as such. But yes, uh, if you look at the government schemes which are related to climate change, there are almost 70 schemes now. So one is seven solar missions and those other missions, Himalayan missions, which were uh, launched long time back. Now there are more than 17 programs which are relating to climate change, which is happening in our country. Uh, unfortunately, the topic that we have chosen today on the health and climate change angle is still not there. Uh, not there is in the form that we are talking about. So the process, everything we possibly cannot put it on the government. Uh, we, we need to first highlight, validate, give, give a direction, and then ask government to go ahead and do it. So even if I take the, the process of going ahead and uh, giving more importance to renewables, which is happening in a very big way for our country, uh, we need to similarly do it for our health infrastructure, because it's all interlinked. The third one is agriculture. Uh, where we have to do a lot of work in, in terms of uh, all these climate-induced impacts which is happening in agriculture. Because that's the, that's the sector which feeds all of us. So uh, this is one area where I, I think we need all ministries, almost all discipline and all ministries to come and work together. Unfortunately, there are only four or five of them which are active. Uh, and uh, that also needs a uh, lot of uh, direction and redirection. This is also a, an area of science, uh, which I think uh, will be discussed later on, where we need a uh, lot of tweaking in between as well. Because more science comes in, we need to re reconfigure our pathways in terms of progress. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an area which is very interesting and also very complex. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my question may be different, uh, but uh, as you headed one of the top institute of the country, that's why I'm putting that question to you. Every evening, uh, you open newspaper, uh, this uh, some TV channel or in the morning newspaper, everybody is talking about KQI nowadays. And even the cities which are really not that bad, the picture is painted like this, that the air quality of Pachinda or Hisan or Jaipur is very bad, whereas actually that is not. So what I feel, this is PM10, that is one of the major contributors. What's your take on this, whether PM10 should be part of KQI calculation or not? I think two experts are there uh, from Navy. Uh, they can elaborate more on this. Thank you. So I will give you a very blunt answer to this. The current KQI <laughs> formula is not right. Okay. <laughs> uh, probably no one will tell you this. Uh, it is highly loaded towards particulate matter, which I also mentioned. Yeah. And most of these particulate matter are not of uh, the anthropogenic origin. This is naturally natural dust. We are a tropical country. Uh, and even during lockdown, so that's the you know, natural experiment I call it, the God's experiment. 
during the lockdown, we almost stopped everything and that was the time when we saw particulate matter background going down. And that's very interesting uh, data. It actually shows that only one place it went down up to 40%, otherwise average was about 30%. It means a lot of dust that we have in our atmosphere is of natural origin. And we cannot control that by, by way of uh, whatever technology that we are talking about. So similarly for AQI, we need to reconfigure, do rethinking and come out with the uh, right AQI for us. I fully agree with you. I have been in Delhi on certain days when AQI was severe. Yes. But it was very nice. Yes. <laughs> right? So I, I think, uh, but that's why I'm saying the science has to evolve. So if, if you find that there are certain numbers which are not making sense, uh, we need to rethink and take it down. Yeah, on final question, Parta, So I'd like to know if you have some kind of thought process on this. So we have a lot of monitoring, air pollution monitoring, or water monitoring. How that is going to help us? Like we can create awareness, identify source, and all those things. I mean, there and yet we can really replace those based on the data, monitoring data. Can we really do solution to it? So uh, monitoring is required, uh, no, no doubt. But how do we do smart monitoring? So spare uh, when we talk. And in this case, let's take air pollution. Uh, same thing could be true for water. In air pollution, when you have when you have data points coming in from the next of the roads or, or the traffic junctions, you will have three to five times of the levels. The moment you go 200 meters away in residential area, your numbers go below. And when you go further away, uh, it goes down. So primarily, uh, most of the decision making, if it happens from a hotspot monitoring. Uh, we can possibly be off in terms of taking control action. So what is needed is that current air quality monitoring stations are divided into three or five different varieties. One is hotspot monitoring, we must do where hotspots are. Second one is what you call a regional air quality. So you know, if I have to describe whole of Lucknow air quality, I need to have a regional background of this. The third one we call it uh, research grade monitoring where we are trying to understand what kind of transport is happening from long distance from here to there or there to there. And the fifth no. one is where we are looking at long term changes which, which may be happening for specific mutant parameters. Not, not like EM and not SO2 and NOx. So these are the kind of monitoring uh, groups which are required and only then we will be able to say what are the right technological options, if at all there are technological options. Uh, there could be options which are just managerial options. So if, if you if you improve your soil moisture, your 30-40% of dust goes down. Your AQI will probably look better. Okay. So thank you so much, sir, for very insightful. Uh, presentation as well as the answers. So thank you so much. So we now move to the, our second speaker. Uh, and we are very happy to have you from Japan. Uh, uh, thank you. You are online for quite some time. And thank you, ma'am, for your wishes and um, participation. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Saudi Hashima. She is an associate professor of environmental health services, sciences laboratory at Hiroshima University. She is an epidemiologist and public health specialist certified by the Japanese Society of Public Health. Her research field is environmental health, community health, and global health. Now she is also studying planetary health science. Her research emphasizes evaluating health effects from environmental factors, including air pollution, natural and man made disaster, accessibility to the health facility and other health system and policy. She had also worked at the Ministry of Health in Senegal and Madagascar as a GICA volunteer and expert. She has published 84 scientific papers in SCI, SSCI index journal related to epidemiology and public health. She also published the translated book, A Social Determinants of Health Sector Edition, Japanese translation. Originally edited by Michael Malmont. Now also she is writing two books related to COVID-19. 
She has been serving as a reviewer for more than 20 SCI, SSCI index journal. She was a member of International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, Japan Public Health Association, uh, Japan uh, Epidemiological Association, and Japan Association for International Health. She is now also a member of WCPRS, which is World Conference on Transport Research Society, COVID-19 Task Force. So uh, with this, uh, I invite Dr. Saudi Kasima to make her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Dr. So, uh, namaste and konnichiwa. Uh, I'm sorry, okay. Kasima. Okay, so uh, I start my slide. Can you see my slide? Can you see my slide? Yes. Can you see? Yes, yes, we can see you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nityan Sensei. I'm very happy to join this uh, uh, session. So, uh, I'm Saori Kashima. I'm Associate Professor of the Environmental Health Science in Hiroshima University. Uh, so, today, this session title is uh, Air Pollution and uh, Oh, sorry, I, I made a mistake too. This is not my different slide. Okay, so um, this uh, session, the top title is air pollution and climate change, sustainable approaches. So I selected this topic, this title, this topic, sanitary health approaches in air pollution climate change studies. So, as you know, as you well know, that according to the data from the uh, World Health Organization, so air pollution, including ambient, outdoor air pollution, and household air pollution, kills 7 million people every year. And it is the fifth leading risk factor for mortality in the global. Uh, particularly, the total air pollution, PM2.5, ozone, and household air pollution uh, contributed to almost 5 million deaths worldwide, nearly one in every 10 deaths in 2017. Uh, around the two third or 4.6 million of the world deaths occurred in Asia. So WHO, uh, Western Pacific and Southeast Asian regions, India and Japan is including this, these regions. Um, of the top 10 countries with the highest number of deaths attributed to the total air pollution, unfortunately, six countries belong to the Asian countries. So as you know, the Asian country is the highest concentration level of the air pollution. And at the global level, uh, in these circumstances, uh, several epidemiological studies have been conducted and have shown the important scientific evidence. Now, uh, WHO summarized the effects attributed to the short and long-term exposure, uh, such as increasing uh, daily mortality, uh, respiratory and cardiovascular hospital admission, lung cancer, and so on. Uh, but most of these studies, however, were conducted in Europe and North America. Asian countries uh, differ from the Western countries in lifestyle, disease incidence, and the pollution levels, and evidence in Asian countries is still limited. So air pollution studies in Asian countries should be conducted more and more. Also, these adverse health effects from air pollution are observed not only in the country with high concentration level of air pollution, but also in those with lower concentration level, like Japan. Uh, so in the low and middle income countries, it is not enough to reduce the air pollution concentration levels to the current level in the high income countries. So in these circumstances, uh, actually we have tried to provide the scientific evidence from Asian countries. 
So uh, we conducted several epidemiological air pollution studies in Japan and also collaborated with some countries uh, such as Republic of Korea, Indonesia, and other Asian countries. But uh, unfortunately, I, I have not conducted the collaboration study with India yet. So I hope near future I can collaborate some collaboration study with Nikian Sensei. And uh, actually, uh, we have published 36 papers to international journal, which is related to the air pollution. And I picked up uh, some of them here. Uh, in addition to the WHO summary, uh, we have somewhat uh, newly observed the adverse health effects of the air pollution. So. Oh, just a moment, point. Okay. The first one is uh, we focus on the very short term effect, even hourly exposure to particle matter. And we reveal that the hourly exposure to air pollution increases the risks of the onset of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. Second one is we evaluated also interaction effects between the outdoor air pollution and indoor, indoor air pollution on childhood respiratory disease in Indonesia. And third one is uh, uh, just we first co uh, conducted a cohort study evaluated the long-term effect of air pollution in Asian countries. Uh, the fourth one, uh, we examined association between the prenatal exposure to traffic related to air pollution and the child behavior development milestone delay in Japan. So it is known that the pre prenatal exposure to traffic related air pollution was also increasing risks of behavioral development milestones delay of children. And the fifth one has evaluated the effect of transboundary air pollution. And we review that transboundary air pollution also have adverse health effect on all codes cerebral vascular disease mortality. And as you know, the air pollution cannot stop the national border. So Dr. Kaushik Sensei also mentioned about the dust storm. So um, usually the, this transboundary air pollu pollutant uh, transmitted, admitted to the dust storm and then uh, the travel to long journey. So also we evaluated the health effect of the these type of the uh, transboundary air pollution. Uh, also, we are conducted the two health impact assessments in 27 Southeast and East Asian cities, and also in the Tokyo study. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I don't have enough time to explain the each study uh, in detail. So if you are interested in, I just showed that uh, I cited uh, some citation. I referred to some citation, so please check the paper. Uh, we have to remember those adverse health effects from air pollution have been frequently observed among vulnerable populations, such as people who work outdoors, young children, and elderly pregnant women, uh, people with underlying the chronic illness, such as asthma, allergies, COPD, heart disease. Also, people who live in the environmental conditions such as close to heavy traffic roads. Also, deteriorated effects were observed among people who suffer from health inequality. Health inequality is strongly related to social and social systems, such as governance, wealth, um, philanthropy, culture, and human behavior. Also, uh, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Kaushik Sensei also mentioned uh, about the effect of the climate change on the air pollution condition. Uh, so as you know, the climate change accelerate the worsening of air quality, such as increasing intense wild, wildfire, increasing pollen, allergen, and so on. In addition to those adverse effects on human health, Air pollution is a major stressor to ecosystems. Also, many sources of air pollution are closely linked to the source of greenhouse gas emissions. So air pollution, climate change, 
biodiversity loss, land use, and land cover change, as well as social system, and connected are connected deeply and also globally. To tackle the such complex and intertwined air pollution issues, current reductionist or thyroid approaches, uh, which are separately and individually approaching each issue, and are mainly employed in the in intervention to tackle challenges of the SDGs, like this one. Uh, but it doesn't provide sufficient solution. So for solving air pollution problems and tackle climate change, we have to shift to a new scientific paradigm, planetary health. So in this planetary health approach, we set a common goal as a planetary health. So the planetary health approach uh, considers a total health which is not only including the human health, but also health social system and health state of the natural system on which it depends. So planetary health is a new science. So this approach offer a holistic approach to investigate all systemic parts, structure, conditions, process, and functions uh, culminating in the challenge. There are some principal underlying drivers such as demographic, developing technology, and food or other consumptions. These factors are related to ecological driver such as global pollution, climate changes, resource scarcity, land use, and cover change altered biogeochemical cycle and biodi biodiversity loss. Then, proximate codes are accelerating to deteriorate of our health status. And mediating factors such as governance, wealth, philanthropy, technology, and culture behavior are also accelerating but also protecting to deterioration of our health status. And so all each factors are very connected and then make adverse health effect on human health. As I told you, the air pollution increases uh, risks of the cardiovascular and the respiratory disease. Uh, but also, as I told you, the air pollution is major stressor to ecosystem. So it's related to amount and quality of food production, which is also related to the malnutrition. When we considering uh, the when we consider the solving air pollution problem and the tackling climate change, so not only focusing on reducing. Uh, the proximity to the air pollution source and of course uh, air pollution, pollu air pollutant, but also we have to consider from the viewpoint of the planetary health approaches. So let's take action to shift to a new scientific field, planetary health science together. And for achieving this approach, so we should co uh, conduct interdisciplinary research also, we should establish a further collaboration network for planetary health approach in air pollution and climate change study. So my, I, my, my study, uh, my presentation is strongly agree with the, uh, Kaushik, uh, Dr. Kaushik. Um, so Dr. Kaushik also mentioned about uh, integrated this, this, this simple importance of the integra integrating discipline. So, uh, also, this air, uh, planetary health approach is also uh, ba based on the interdisciplinary researches. Okay, so I hope I can uh, make uh, some good network uh, with all of you. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Dr. Nathan, you are on mute, it seems.
Thank you very much, uh, Saudi Sensei, for your very informative uh, talk and uh, introducing the concept of planetary health and uh, also letting us know that there are so many factors and it's quite uh, interrelated complex uh, issues which we need to understand to help. So, thanks again and we'll take up the question after the session. So, please uh, be there. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, we will move to the third panelist uh, and our good friend, Dr. Suraj Sharma. Uh, who is a program officer of the uh, United Nations Environmental Program and currently based at uh, Kenya. So, Dr. Sanchana is uh, working with the uh, UNAP in India as a program officer. He is a PhD in environmental scientist from the Indian Institute of Technology in Italy and has more than 18 years of uh, experience in the area of uh, environment and natural resource management. Before UNEP, he has worked as director at Delhi uh, and has worked with a wide range of environmental and sustainability issues, including air pollution, waste management, and so on. Uh, he has experience of working closely with national and uh, state government bodies, academia, corporate, and NGOs, as well as the media. He has several peer reviewed publications to his credit and uh, vast experience of working on and environment. So, welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Sumit, and thanks for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nitin. Uh, just to mention that I am not based in Kenya, I am I am in Delhi. Uh, sharing my screen. I hope uh, you can see my screen, if you can confirm. Yes. Okay. So, uh, I think the stage is already set and uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar uh, Dr. Kashima has very clearly uh, stated the linkages between uh, air pollution, health, climate, and several other environmental factors. Uh, I will just like to contextualize uh, more in context of uh, you know air pollution in India, what are the sources, and how they are linked with the, the climate change issue, and how we can actually gain some momentum by integrating several strategies, which can provide us a lot of co-benefits. So it's a very uh, general slide. Uh, this can be presented in several ways, has already been presented in several ways. We know the pollution uh, in India is high, whether we see the CPCB data, whether we see the satellite images, or we see the modeled product uh, as we see on the right hand uh, of this slide. You'll find that uh, the Indo-Gangetic Plains especially are heavily polluted and more in winters because of uh, meteorological conditions. Uh, but uh, we have enough emissions in place, uh, which which uh, basically lead to these kind of high concentrations during winter season. That does not mean that summers are clear. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a uh, de decent amount of pollution levels if we compare it with the standards. Uh, we do not meet our standards at several places even during summers. Now, it's not just uh, a few years. Uh, it has been uh, consistently there for last almost two decades. For several cities, uh, if you plot this uh, graph of PM concentrations, you will find that uh, they have been violating the standards. In some cities like Delhi, it has grown uh, uh, since 2005 onwards with the excessive growth and not just growth in the city, but uh, in the regions which are surrounding the city of Delhi. Well, if you uh, see it over uh, over a particular year, you will find that uh, you know winters uh, and the post uh, uh, monsoon season are the most polluted season, and uh, this is valid across uh, all different years. Uh, that does not mean, as I said, in summers we are meeting the standard. It is still still above the uh, you know uh, really standard of PM two point five. Uh, it is only during the monsoons we have uh, the air quality which is uh, within the prescribed national limits. The impacts have been well elaborated by uh, the previous speakers. Uh, almost, uh, you know, 1.6 million mortalities are attributable to air pollution, which is almost 17% of total deaths happening in the country, and almost 60% of this are uh, attributable to ambient uh, pollution levels. Uh, Dr. Kashima talked about the loss of agricultural productivity. There are a number of publications, peer-reviewed publications now 
which are stating that almost 20 to 30 percent of wheat uh, is is uh, you know is lost in India because of high ozone concentration, especially in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, which is the most fertile land we have in the country. There are impacts visible on buildings, on on cultural heritage, and most importantly, uh, we have now seen uh, linkages being established between uh, air pollution levels and uh, you know regional scale climate change. Whether it is the changes in the temperatures, whether whether it is changes in the in the uh, you know planetary boundary layers, uh, and and of course on the you know rainfall patterns, uh, air pollution is being attributed to do some sort of impact over prevailing uh, regional scale climatic conditions. All this leads to a lot of economic loss, and there are uh, varying levels of uh, uh, estimates which actually show that there is the, the overall economic loss is immense and uh, uh, the, the costs of interventions will be much, much lesser than the uh, economic loss which we are incurring due to high pollution. I'll focus my talk uh, majorly on this uh, uh, latest paper which we published uh, with, with colleagues in Terry and with the National Institute of Environmental Science in Japan and uh, University of California, San Diego. Uh, this is about, uh, you know, emission inventories at national scale in the country and then uh, which sources are contributing how much uh, to the prevailing PM 2.5 concentrations. Now, if you see the emission inventories, uh, PM 2.5 uh, is being mainly contributed by residential and uh, industrial sector. Uh, power sector has a limited role considering you have uh, electrostatic precipitators installed there. Uh, but if you see the SO2 and NOx, uh, then the role of power sector becomes quite important. The role of transport becomes very, very important in case of NOx emissions. This is how the spatial distribution of emissions look like. Uh, you have high PM emissions attributable to biomass burning happening in rural kitchens uh, in the indo gangetic plains. Uh, NOx emissions are particularly high at power plant uh, based locations or uh, at the city level where you have high density of vehicular, uh, uh, vehicular fleets. SO2 emissions are particularly high at industrial locations, at, at power plants. And of course, VOCs are found to be dominated by residential uh, biomass burning. Now, if you put all these emissions into an air quality model and then try to validate it with the actual concentrations, uh, this is how uh, the yearly and, and, and seasonal concentrations of PM 2.5 look like. Uh, the model could successfully reproduce uh, high winters concentrations, especially during uh, in, in the indo gangetic plains and comparatively lesser concentrations uh, in, the, in the summer regions. You can see that the model could uh, successfully reproduce uh, what you observe uh, from, from satellite also. The, the three figures uh, at the bottom are the satellite-based uh, AOD observations, and they are following uh, the very similar pattern reproduced by the model. Now, we use the model to assess the contribution of different sources to PM 2.5 concentrations. This is what it comes out to be. Uh, we find that almost one-third of PM 2.5 is contributed by residential sector biomass burning in 2016. Industries uh, is contributing to almost 16%. Uh, transport and power are contributing to 7% each. And uh, agricultural residue burning is contributing to about 8%. Now, this is a national level India, India figure. Uh, if you go to a specific city, a specific state, specific region, the values will change. Like in this case, uh, if you focus on the IGP, the Indo-Gangetic Plains region and the rest of India, you will find that the contribution of residential sector becomes even higher in Indo-Gangetic Plains, which is 38%, and it goes down to 24% in the rest of India. The contribution of industries, on the other hand, become more uh, in case of rest of India, while uh, in IGP, it goes down to some extent. Uh, another thing to be noted here, which uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar was talking about, is this natural dust. Uh, if you see the last row, this is what we could estimate that almost 17-24% of uh, PM2.5 in India is uh, contributed by the background dust coming from international boundaries, which has a lot of natural uh, uh, contributions. 
We also tried to estimate the share of different chemical species. And what we found is that uh, almost 40% is of uh, primary PM2.5 uh, origin. Uh, almost uh, 27% is coming from uh, the inorganic chemistry happening between ammonia and uh, you know SO2 and uh, oxides of nitrogen. And uh, almost 33% is attributable to secondary organic uh, aerosols. Now, uh, if you if you see the species, you will find that uh, you know black carbon is contributing to almost uh, three four percent. You have uh, secondary inorganics in the range of 26, 27 percent. Now we know that the black carbon and and some of the organic part of the carbon is responsible for trapping the heat and uh, making the uh, you know atmosphere warmer. On the other hand, you have secondary inorganics and uh, other dusty crustal particles which are known to reflect the light and making the, the atmosphere and earth surface cooler. So uh, there is this uh, tussle uh, happening between the climate warmers and climate uh, coolers. And this is what leads to uh, you know, a change in climate based on uh, what type of particles are present and how much they are present. Uh, contributing to changes in, uh, you know, uh, uh, reflection and uh, attribution of sunlight. Now, uh, why I was talking about all these species, because, uh, you know, uh, we all know that uh, climate change and air pollution are the two sides of the same coin. And uh, this is how uh, air pollution can play a very important role in uh, combating climate change. Uh, this is a you know almost a decade old UNEP study which projected that uh, if we grow in a BAU scenario, our temperatures, the global average temperatures, will increase by almost 2.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, if we take measures for control for CO2, we'll be able to control it by by say half a half a degree, and we will end up having an increase of two degrees Celsius. But if we uh, include the controls over air pollutants, the mm -hmm. short-lived climate pollutants, black carbon and methane, then you can reduce the overall decrease, uh, increase of the temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And in this context, uh, I, would, I would like to say that this time has come when, when we start to integrate the two issues. We start to discuss how the two strategies uh, can be integrated to provide multiple benefits. Uh, we know that the <clears throat> emission inventories of uh, CO2 and PM2.5 are quite different. As you can see in this graph, the, the power sector uh, has a very large contribution in CO2, but uh, if you see its contribution in PM2.5 inventories, it's, just, it's not so large. So benefits cannot be uh, directly linearly proportional. And we need to uh, do proper assessments. We need to identify strategies which can provide maximum co-benefits for both air pollution control and uh, combating climate change. There are several opportunities in, in different sectors. If you see, uh, we have a uh, transition happening to renewables. We have, uh, you know, PAT schemes, uh, which are which are improving our energy efficiency in the industries. Uh, the cleaner technologies like zigzag kilns coming in, in the brick sector, the Ujula Yojana, the, the energy efficiency improvements happening in buildings, the electrical uh, mobility uh, uh, stream, which the country is moving towards, and all this have a lot of potential of not only reducing the the fuel uh, uh, you know consumption, uh, improve, improving our energy security, but also a lot of uh, potential to reduce climate change and and uh, air pollutant emissions. This is one study which we did uh, uh, in, in Terry, which found that if India moves on its path towards INDCs to meet its target, committed target under the Paris uh, Agreement, then we are bound to get uh, an automatic decrease of almost 13% in the PM2.5 concentrations of India. And that clearly shows that integration of policies of uh, air pollution control and climate has a merit, and uh, that can provide uh, you know, further emphasis for st stronger enforcement and smoother implementation of, of activities. My, la my last slide, as, as some recommendations, uh, I'm a big advocate of regional scale as assessments. Um, in all of our studies, what we found is that cities alone cannot uh, resolve this problem, and you need to take measures at a very large scale, very larger uh, region, uh, in fact, in the whole airshed, to reduce uh, air pollution levels in a city effectively. We must not only control primary, but should also control secondary pollutants because they have a very important role in PM2.5 concentrations and also 
uh, in influencing climate. And for that, we need uh, speciation networks. So not just PM 2.5, but the species of PM 2.5 needs to be monitored and tracked on a regular basis. Of course, we need uh, policies uh, to integrate uh, air quality and climate concerns. Uh, we need business models for implementation of these strategies and the use of low cost models. We all, always talk about, you, you know, use of low cost monitors. But now uh, time has come where we can take, take help of, uh, you know, uh, technologies like artificial neural networks to carry out forecasting and spatial mapping exercises. And uh, last but not the least, uh, we have to, you know, uh, uh, you know, we have to strengthen the enforcement through technological support. What we found is that uh, the capacities in the pollution control boards are limited. And uh, in a country like India, it will be very difficult to do it manually. We need technological supports. We need those kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, equipments, uh, technologies so that uh, monitor monitoring can be better and vigilance can be improved. So this is what uh, uh, we, we estimate that if we can employ uh, all good strategies in place, then the condition can improve dramatically and we can have uh, uh, a situation where uh, the whole of India meets its, its quality standards uh, on a regular basis. Thank you. So this is uh, what I wanted to say today. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sumit, for highlighting the correlation of uh, air pollution and climate change, and also uh, introducing some flagship programs related to these uh, problems. And uh, I fully appreciate that, uh, yes, uh, it's a reason scale assessment and strategies which will be very important for NK and uh, the projections and estimates which are in case as well. So, thanks once again for being with us and to please uh, be there because uh, after this, two more or uh, three more panelists uh, will take up some round of questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, let us now move to uh, our fourth panelist, uh, Mrs. P. Padma Israel. And um, thank you, ma'am, for being with us. So we know that you underwent some surgery and uh, being unwell also, you. Uh, like no, you have been with us, so it's uh, we appreciate that. So, uh, Mrs. B. Padma Rao uh, has masters in civil engineering from V. N. I. T. Nagpur and bachelor's in chemical engineering from N. I. T. Nagpur. She is doctorate and foundation fellow of Lead India UK program uh, cohort and member of MCAP committee of CPCB MOEA. Uh, she is also the nodal officer for TTZ Matters, CSI R Nagpur. She is Senate member of IIIT Nagpur. She has completed more than 150 research uh, and consultancy projects on air quality monitoring, uh, management, emission inventory, control, environment audit, and impact assessment and carrying capacity projects for industries, industrial areas, urban, social, and ecologically fragile areas, um, in addition to mines, monuments, uh, development projects, etc. So, development of various air pollution control systems for emission control of crematoria, small scale uh, line fields, as well as traffic exact, uh, intersection emissions are successfully demonstrated uh, under her uh, leadership and been taken up in pilot model. The mobile emission monitoring and control van, first of its kinds, is developed for emission monitoring and control studies and is being used in industries, which she has worked on and developed, carrying capacity-based development planning for national capital region, that is NCR, environmental impact and risk assessment for proposed new and expansion of projects, uh, emission treatment studies, performance evaluation of environmental management systems for especially cement, steel, textile and power plants. With this, I invite you, uh, Dr. Um, Padma Kustav, to please um, give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Piali. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't join all the earlier uh, sessions, uh, training sessions, because I was not well. Uh, I'd like to share my screen and uh, a little uh, publication, a little presentation, what I wanted to do. 
the screen is being shared now hello not yet is the screen shared now uh, no not not yet Hello, ma'am. Yeah, on the middle of the screen, there is an option to share the screen. Beside that, uh, we do want. Can you see? Okay, let let me just uh, talk about it. I think I'm not able to share the screen. Uh, I would like to talk about the challenges of urban air pollution. Uh, what we have faced in our country. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So now the screen is being shared. No. Not yet. Okay. I think you can go ahead with those slides as possible. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, I would like to talk about the challenges that we face in the urban air pollution. Most uh, predominant challenges that we can solve, uh, and vis-a-vis -vis solve the climate change issues. Uh, let me introduce with the consequence of urban development that is leading to air pollution. Uh, that the first thing is, uh, first we have a core area that is a small urban area that is not being developed more. It is having a good buffer area which which is acting as a sink for dry and wet deposition, soil plant action, atmospheric conversion and chemical reaction, what Dr. Sharma and Dr. Uh, Rakesh Kumar said in the morning. So the buffer area, what is there in the small urban area, which is surrounded acts as a sink for assimilation of all the pollution that is coming out from this urban area. So what is happening now, this sink, that is the buffer area is getting reduced. And the cities are getting more and more, more and more expanded, leading to high levels of pollution, and since we have a calm area that is developed in these cities in most of the time and low level of emissions, there are temperature inversions. There is a concentration of all the buildings and narrow streets. So we lead, it, this all leads to a very high amount of emissions. So what is happening? Like in Delhi, it is now a city which is extended to a large area. Now it, is, it has no more any buffer area for taking up all this sink. So we are ending up with smog that is phytotoxic chemicals such as ozone, PA, and etc. Now, if we just diagnose our core to buffer ratio, we will see that in most of these cities that are very, very dirty in some areas of the world, we have cities which have more than 500 square kilometers, like some cities in Iran, Mongolia, Pakistan, India, and other cities, Hong Kong. Where, these, uh, uh, where the development area is more than 500 kilometers, square kilometers, you will find all these sort of air polluted cities in the world. Means the buffer area to the core area is very less. The ratio of buffer to core area is very less. This simply means that we don't have any sink. We don't have any, what you say, a receptor for taking up all the pressures that is built up in the land. Similarly, if you see some of the cleanest cities in the world, like Honolulu, like Finland, like some cities in US, USA, Sweden, Switzerland, Canada, et cetera, et cetera. So you will find that most of the areas, urban developed areas which are clean, are having less than 500 square kilometers as their core urban area. So we need to rationalize our core and buffer zone activity to such an extent that we have a high buffer zone which will take up all the pressures that are being developed in the land. Maybe it is a pressure due to air pollution. Maybe it is a pressure due to heavy rains. Maybe it is a pressure due to uh, uh, any, any toxic release, which is a uh, disaster. So these are all the events uh, which, which, which will be taken care of very nicely by the buffer areas. So, so, so there is a need when we just uh, do some planning of the urban area. There is a need to rationalize this core and buffer zone activity. We cannot go on having high uh, core buffer to core ratios uh, to, to see that our urban areas are getting more and more polluted. Second thing, once we have done that, second thing, we need to identify the hotspots that are developed because of our urban activity. Now, what does our urban activity in terms of air pollution say? 
it it says that we have around three sources three major sources like industrial uh, residential and the transport activity so this is leading to lots of hot spots so are we having any plan for doing some uh, what you say effective management for our hot spots so hot spot management is important hot spot management as dr sharma said there are 10 major actions that can be taken we have to do it at the hot spot level also once we do it at the hot spot then only the urban area in totality will get a good cleaner air quality action so this is called a micro action plan that is inbuilt in the ncap uh, program of the government of india now what do you do with the hot spot like ujwala yojana clean up fuel or alternate energy pollution control management then green belts so these are all some of the things that we can do in the hot spot apart from this apart from this we have to see our products also like our air conditioners these are giving what you say apart from air pollution these are giving uh, heat load also so heat load is also one of the important factor for which is affecting air pollution as well as the climate change so how are we placing our air conditioners are are these creating local hot spots and identifying uh, the areas of high energy concern so these are also very important things that we need to look at when we talk about the urban area planning now what is happening if if we do a conventional source apportionment study and do the uh, find out the composition chemical composition of the final dust maybe pm 2.5 or 10 so we find that across the country across the country the pm fraction uh, the uh, the oc by ec fraction is not more than 7 to 8 this this basically means that the oc ec that is the organic uh, carbon and the ec ratios typically range from 1 to 1.42 for gasoline and diesel powered vehicles and for, from 16.8 to 40 maybe for wood wood combustion and 32 to 81 for uh, this one uh, for kitchen emissions so as rightly said by dr sharma the residential emissions are uh, getting more and more because we are having a good roads now we are not having that suspended dust in areas like delhi because earlier it was very high but now maybe because of construction and other activities it may be there but eventually this Uh, the dust that is coming out with a high oc by ec ratio it may be because of the residential combustion which needs to be taken care of so these are some of the areas where hello am i audible hello yeah can i continue you to kada bhaiya tabhi cut kar you are audible you can probably can i continue Yes, you can continue, but uh, we have some time constraints. So, if you can, uh, okay, okay. I just quickly, quickly sum up. So, what are what are all those areas where we can do uh, good mitigation options? That I would like to just uh, sum up with uh, one one thing is like we have to find out more um, uh, what you say controls for vehicles, industries, thermal power plants. and which may lead to zero emissions this is very important because now we have ncap uh, which is active for all the 120 plus cities of the country so we should aim for zero pollution so for that all the small scale and the medium scale industries sh should have install all the proper uh, air pollution control systems their third party audit needs to be done by the with the, with the regulatory agencies very scrupulously all the thermal power power plants are already uh, regulated for uh, denox and desox systems and also the uh, uh, area sources like solid waste combustions the open pit crematorias etc etc needs to have all well equipped with all the controls so that we did we need not emit anything it's a zero emission strictly that needs to be followed otherwise we will land up in all sorts of uh, emissions and then our bau will always be there we will not find any emissions that is for a uh, better better air pollution control so these are all the things for the industries and the air uh, and the what if so area sources similarly we should have controls at the pathways like we have our uh, controls at the uh, traffic intersections uh, and also ventilation proper ventilation for the road corridors we should have plant green belt dense green belt systems and our control in the flyovers also is important because city like delhi has got 
n number of flyovers wherein you can find emissions coming out at the height of 30 meters so you can imagine what will happen a line source emitting uh, uh, emissions at a height of 30 meters it will naturally form smog there will be there is no uh, escape to this so we don't have any control at that height so we should aim for that also controls at the flyovers construction activities needs to be properly exactly controlled as per the cpcb regulations this is very important we should provide pathways for cycling for walking etc incentives to be there and there are some more systems like paintings and hoardings through titanium dioxide limestone coatings which are there as passive uh, controls similar controls at the receptor uh, for cleaning the uh, what you say uh, polluted air at the receptor level uh, controls at the traffic nodes uh, restricting the vehicular growth restricting the uh, weekend weekday holidays and then restricting the office uh, timings or regulating the office timings both intra city and inter city travels of uh, this thing needs to be regulated movement of trucks and buses etc these are all there in the action plan of the city and this needs to be scrupulously mm -hmm. done and unless otherwise we do that it will be very difficult i would like to talk two three things things about the mobile van that we have constructed in our uh, institute this is a van which will monitor as well as control the air pollution in a pilot mode so we had applied this for a thermal power plant of 210 megawatt and we had find uh, we had found that it has worked very nicely reducing the so2 even the co2 levels to many extent and this has been given to a this, uh, to a mahajanko thermal power unit in the nagpur so we hope that we will be doing it much more in uh, other thermal power plants similarly we have done controls for the uh, uh, crematoria emissions also in delhi and it has given nice control uh, for pm10 pm2.5 and all most of the gaseous emissions including the organic emissions so similar controls needs to be done for traffic intersections our vayu is already there in delhi and it's functioning very effectively now uh, there is a need uh, to uh, introspect very critically about how clean is clean fuels because we see that the 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 cleaner fuels uh, emit more uh, finer fractions of the uh, dust so we need to introspect do more studies on the use of cleaner fuels and the impact on the finer dust this is what i wanted to say thank you so much thank you so much uh, to about our not only highlighting the india's aspect uh, air pollution problems but also the mitigation measures which uh, you have implemented through your work uh, we really appreciate that you introduce this thanks to the audience so please be with us for the question and answer session thanks a lot the next uh, panelist uh, with us is uh, dr anurag sir khan he's uh, currently working as a senior principal scientist at the environmental monitoring division of uh, csir in the institute of toxicological research in lucknow is uh, is a master and doctor in environmental engineering and uh, he has long work experience over 30 years in the field of uh, environmental impact assessment and other environmental studies uh, uh, related to studies industrial hygiene urban air pollution and indoor air quality he has uh, over 31 and taken mnc students and has done a number of publications in the related journals so we are indeed fortunate to have you dr azam khan with us and i request you to please go ahead with your presentation Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Nitin. So I am thankful to the organizer for giving me this opportunity to share my some of the ideas related to indoor air quality and indoor air pollution. So basically, what my previous speakers they have covered, I should say entirely all the aspects of air pollution, air and climate change. So. Dr. Shilesh Sharma and Dr. Rakesh Kumar and our expert from Japan, they have shared some of their observations with indoor air pollution and their effects also. So, what is the situation in our country? Uh, definitely, 
when we see the international uh, data published by WH and uh, it is also said by Dr. Rakesh Kumar also and everybody that uh, there are health problems which are related to air pollution. And uh, again, uh, it is said that uh, at about 99% of the world population is living uh, in places where WHO standards are exceeded. So that is very low, as 15 microgram per meter to for 20 over 24 hours mean and PM10 45. So our standards are a little bit higher in India. So reason is being said that lot of uh, natural dust or inert dust is also included in that. So uh, that is the case and uh, there is a lot of deaths are there, premature death and it is all from the low and middle income group countries and uh, like uh, many diseases are there which are from this. There is data available for uh, indoor air pollution, deaths and all. So about 2.6 billion people putting using such kind of biomass fuels across the globe. And again, there is a 3.8 million premature death. So uh, it is true that from both the pollution like indoor and outdoor, there will be some deaths. One more important thing is that almost all the burden was from low middle income countries. Okay. And one more point which is important in this respect is that black carbon, soot particles and methane emitted by inefficient stove combustion are powerful climate change pollutants. So again it is established that uh, indoor air pollution is also contributing to climate change. Uh, one uh, old study about uh, three decades ago uh, Professor Kirk Smith has done a lot of studies in India in his 80s and 90s and uh, here we can see that uh, the places where households are using biomass, this is indoor pollution and other areas in the same city, Pune, where kerosene is being used, this is indoor air pollution and this is outdoor and this is LPG. So it, it, it indicates in dense urban areas, household fuels can contribute significant, significantly to general air pollution. So, whosoever is staying there, they are exposed to more pollution, maybe indoor or outdoor. Okay. So, uh, that is why the uh, mortality from indoor air pollution is significant in such places. So, when we talk about the Indian scenario, uh, like other speakers also told, but I would like to discuss here in the perspective of indoor air pollution. Like uh, for industries, there are point sources. So we have all rules and regulations for emission from different states like thermal power plant and any other plant. Uh, we have work area sources where people are working. So there are standards under uh, Industrial Safety Act and all the protection and uh, correction measures, control measures are being taken and of late government has implemented online continuous emission and effluent monitoring system OCEMS from April 2018. So the entire industrial activity may be indoor inside the work area or whatever emission is coming out of the industry is being monitored and directly sent data is being sent to CPCB for the pattern control. So measures are being taken although there are some shortfalls that is a different issue but it is being taken care of. Similarly, when we talk about uh, our city, there are industrial sources, transport sources and some other sources. So under uh, Environmental Protection Act and Motor Vehicle Act, there are pollution in the cities and all those aspects are also covered. But when we talk about indoor, maybe it is residential or commercial or schools, shopping malls, etc. Uh, there are no such regulations, we are still waiting for that and for that uh, of course, things have been initiated, I will talk in later slides. So for, uh, uh, if we talk about the uh, outdoor data, CBC, we have a lot of data, like SAFAR project uh, of uh, IIH, 
IIPM, that is also there. So, uh, all these things are going on regarding outdoor air pollution. Indoor air pollution, we are still there. So, I will talk a little bit about indoor air pollution. So, this is the real air we work and live, and the air which we breathe during most of our lives. Right? We are spending more time in indoor, like this today's schedule, if you see, all of us here indoor throughout the day. We are not going out. So, what are the uh, parameters for our comfort? That is temperature, humidity, wind flow and noise. If less noise, we are comfortable. And our health is affected by contaminants like bacteria, particulate matter and gases. That is true for air pollution, uh, maybe indoor or outdoor. Okay. So, uh, as of now, we don't have any indoor quality standards in our country for uh, offices or residential areas or malls, whatever it may be. I have uh, studied uh, many uh, the data from different countries and the standards I have just summarized here. Uh, it is found that this uh, comfort parameters like temperature, humidity, uh, in different countries, it depends slight change, but it is not very really much varying. And uh, as far as standards for biological and chemical contaminants are concerned, so these are the some ranges. Normally, these are uh, given in this range, but we don't have such a standard. So we have to have such a standard in future. Uh, if we talk about the research in our uh, done by our uh, research organizations like IITs, NIDI, or many other CSI organizations and uh, many academic institutions, it is mostly focused on indoor air pollution from biomass fuel burning, that is from kitchen. Some studies uh, have been observed that indoor study was assessed for air conditioned building also. So, current uh, scenario is like that. There is a growth in urban population. So, air conditioned built area is increasing. Air, uh, in our transport sector, also all the vehicles are now air conditioned. So, uh, this uh, graph just shows that what would be the household air conditions in millions. So, it is very, very high. It is going to increase, increasing at a faster rate. So, what are the factors uh, which are affecting the indoor air quality? Some outdoor air is penetrating inside, then building material, then VOC coming from these materials, tightness, ventilation and tightness of the building. Occupancy level is very important. Many people are there, and so there will be more pollution. Equipment, what being used there. Customs, habits, traditions of the residents, economic status of occupants, climate, and These are the factors which decide indoor air quality. There are some studies are here. So, uh, in, in indoor air quality studies of uh, air conditioned building, so there are some sick building syndromes identified in the study in Delhi. In our study, we, our group has done a study for indoor kitchens in North and South India and it was found that these parameters are exceeding the limits and uh, this exposure to these pollutants associated, associated with a decline in lung function of kitchen workers. Okay. So, these are established by different study groups that indoor air quality is deteriorating and that is to be taken care of. So, their uh, committee was formed wherein people from IITs, NIDI, CPCB, and other organizations were there. And uh, they have submitted a, a report to CPCB, and uh, we are waiting for the recommendations to be implemented to develop the standard and other protocols for the indoor air pollution. So, what is the IAQ can be divided into urban and rural? Then natural and mechanically ventilated buildings are there, here only naturally. Here HVAC systems are also there. So here circulation indoors, measurement of ventilation to be done, identification of contaminants and their sources, monitoring of contaminants, ventilation.
precision comfort parameter at various locations to be done to each building. Then data interpretation, detection of identity, uh, identification of control measures to be done. Reports of occupant health complaints to be done. And laying down the standard limits for various contaminants and ventilation parameters for different building times by government bodies to be done. So that is all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Arthur, uh, thank you so much and uh, I think you took the minimum time and uh, so uh, thank you so much. So now we move to our last speaker and uh, if I may so I think he is the youngest speaker also. Uh, so now I invite uh, Nidhi Shri, he is my colleague from the same institute we belong to. Uh, and uh, Mr. Nidhi Shri is currently working in Chedi as I said, as an associate fellow of the Art Science and Climate Change Division. He has completed his MPA in Atmospheric Oceanic Sciences from IIT Delhi and uh, presently is pursuing his PhD from same department uh, on air pollution and climate change leakages. He has worked both as a team member and project leaders in multiple projects on ambient air quality monitoring, source emission monitoring, source appointment studies, air quality management studies and third party assessment studies. Uh, along with area-wide environmental quality management studies. Uh, additionally, he has also participated in uh, different capacity building of state and central pollution control board officials by training them on air quality dispersal modeling. So with this, uh, Nimish, if I uh, request, uh, I may request also you to uh, limit your presentation within each minutes. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, most uh, most of our esteemed panelists have spoken about the uh, air pollution and climate change and the impact uh, they have on each other, based on uh, the health impact also. So, I would like to continue on that part and uh, discuss about the benefits one might have uh, when the combined approach to mitigate the climate and air quality uh, is targeted. So basically, the main sources for both air pollution and climate change are the combustion of fossil fuels uh, from the biomass for energy and non-energy purposes, along with the livestock. Uh, the short-lived climate pollutants are the powerful forces that remain in the atmosphere for a much shorter period of time than the carbon dioxide, yet their potential to warm the atmosphere can be many times greater. Certain short-lived climate pollutants are also dangerous air pollutants that have harmful effect on people, the ecosystem, and the agricultural productivity. Also, uh, you might have heard about the uh, hydrofluorocarbons, which are also included in the SLCPs, even though their lifetime is not as short as compared to the other SLCPs, and they are one of the fastest growing greenhouse gases in many countries, including India. There, uh, there has to be action to limit their growth, to uh, mitigate their growth, because if they are uh, not stopped at this point of time, we might not be able to achieve our uh, climatic targets that we have um, put ourselves uh, to be below 1.5 degrees Celsius and to 2 degrees Celsius. And uh, uh, by 2050, the annual climate forcing of HSCs could be equal to 40% of the forcing from presently that we are actually getting from carbon dioxide. The targeting SLCPs provides us opportunity to deal with the dual problems of both air pollutants as well as the climatic action. They will not only just limit the uh, growth of the climate change impact, but will also mitigate the impact on human health that we are actually observing and many of the esteemed panelists have already spoken about. Hence, there is a need to develop a holistic plan to mitigate the SLCPs, which should be aligned with the objectives of India's other national commitments like NCAP, NAPCC, SAPC, and NDC, ICAP. Uh, this uh, slide shows us about how the strong linkages are there between the air quality, SLCP, and climate. So, uh, climate changes. 
So in the first part, we can actually see that uh, GHGs like CO2, CH4 are the long-term warming, uh, long-term warming effect and climate change effect. While the air pollutants down there have an impact on decreasing the crop yields, impacting the human health uh, directly, or also uh, deteriorating the various infrastructure uh, in our urban areas. While the SLCPs can be seen, uh, which are like uh, methane, ozone, black carbon, or the uh, precursors to uh, the ozones, which have near-term warming impact on the climate, Along with that, there are certain climate forces like sulfate, which have a cooling effect on the atmosphere. So uh, there was a study conducted by Venkatraman uh, in 2016, where they actually analyzed what is uh, the amount of SLCPs uh, in CO2 equivalent and GHG uh, in 2015 in CO2 equivalent and what are the sectors that are majorly contributing towards SLCPs and GHGs. So here basically uh, the planning to mitigate them together should be done because in isolation if we are dealing directly with the thermal power plants which are a major contributor in terms of GHGs or the industries bigger industries again. So almost uh, the GHG chart is 75% contributed by these two major things. Rest, transport, informal industries, residential sector and agriculture contribute quite less. While we are looking at the SLCPs, we actually find that the residential sector alone contributes about 59%. While the uh, formal industries were contributing about 30% of the GHGs, here there is no emissions from the formal industries because of the control on the tailpipe emissions. And similarly, there is no uh, mention of the thermal power plants, again, for the same reason, because of the various state pipe controls that have been established. Rather, we find that informal industries, uh, about 15% contribute here. And the uh, agriculture sector is there with 8% of the fee field burning, open burning that we see. So uh, the policies like LPG penetration by Ujjwala Yojana is definitely helping us in uh, mitigating the SLCPs. But when we are actually looking at the energy sector, uh, the policies are mostly around, uh, in the air pollution terms when we talk about, the mitigation is basically around the primary particulate matters rather than the precursors. When we are looking at the transport sector, which is the highest sensitive, which shows the highest sensitivity towards the tropospheric ozones, is the largest contributor of NOx, which has about 46 total 46 uh, percent contribution, national contribution towards NOx emissions. Uh, when we are looking at the industries, they show second highest sensitivity towards tropospheric ozone concentrations. In the uh, in terms of industries, it is the second biggest contributor of BC emissions, including all industries, which is about 22%. Out of this 22%, maximum is contributed by the MSMEs as they have no control, uh, no tailpipe controls, and because uh, there are no mandatory environmental law or regulations on them, and they are unorganized, so it's very hard to control them. So. About 15% of the total SLCPs are contributed by MSMEs alone, of which 40% of this 15% comes from brick industry. Again, looking at the power sector, it shows the third highest tropospheric ozone uh, sensitivity towards the tropospheric ozone concentration, and it is the second major contributor of NOx emissions in India. Again and again, I am stressing towards the NOx emissions because a study conducted by uh, Sharma et al. in 2016 showed that the Indian conditions, uh, the ozone can. Ozone is more sensitive towards the NOx uh, sensitivity, as uh, hence, uh, as opposed to VOCs, and hence the control over NOx might yield much better result in controlling the ozone concentrations, which will help us in con contributing towards both the uh, arresting the impact from the air, air pollution as the ozone has impact on wheat yields along with the global warming potential that ozone carries with it. 
uh, this already uh, Dr. Sumit Sharma sir has shown uh, about the CCAC study, which actually showed us that uh, uh, arresting the black carbon and methane emissions will help us uh, arrest about 0.5 degrees Celsius. HFCs uh, arrest uh, policies mitigating HFCs will arrest about 0.1 degrees Celsius, and together all the short-lived climate pollutants will help us arrest about 0.6 degrees Celsius. So when we are looking at the 2050 line, we actually get to see that uh, if we are looking at the business as usual scenario, we will touch about 2 degrees Celsius by 2050. Uh, when we are controlling BC and methane emissions only, we are able to arrest it uh, much before uh, that, that is about 1.5 degrees Celsius. And when the actions are taken together, we are seeing a much better future even after 2050 and hence we will be able to meet our targets. So a common plan is very much needed, which has to be in line with the present uh, government's climate commitment along with the policies like NCAP. So there are multiple opportunities that are present in India for mitigating the SLCPs as there has been no studies establishing the national scenarios for policy. Uh, what should be the SLCP's uh, mitigation at this point of time and what are the scenarios based on various interventions that can be taken uh, to arrest the SLCP emissions, hence arresting both the uh, impact of from air pollutants and the GHG emissions. This kind of delivering targets has to be made and I think uh, science has to take the front seat on this one. We have to demonstrate how we can actually showcase of the different scenarios uh, from the present policies that are already in place which should be prioritized based on the uh, analysis that we should conduct and uh, from there we can actually prioritize which actions should be taken first from both the sides which might help us in mitigating both air pollutants as well as the climate change and uh, based on that uh, legal frameworks and standards should be uh, suggested at this point of time i can uh, i would uh, like to tell you uh, tell everyone here that uh, terry is already working on one such plan with unep and empre uh, and we are developing national action plan for short lived climate pollutant but uh, based on our assessment as our, till now, there are not many studies conduct, uh, conducted on this field and uh, this is a very good platform where climate change and air pollution is being talked about in front of all the esteemed panelists and speakers and listeners and I'm very much hopeful to hear about uh, what our researchers have actually uh, estimated in their papers. Thank you. This much from my side. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Minister, and I truly appreciate that you being the last panelist, you have very nicely correlated the air pollution and the climate change and made our job really easy. So here we come at the end of this uh, panel discussion, and uh, in short of time, we will straightway go for the questions and uh, comments if uh, there are from those who are present in this hall as well as uh, the people attending this uh, this uh, session online. So please go ahead. So, any question for any uh, panelist? We have taken enough questions for Dr. Rakesh Kumar, so I think we can restrict our questions to the rest of the panelists if there are. Yeah, uh, please, nobody asked the question, I can ask the question. Please, please, please. Sorry. Sorry, uh, 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 Tasima, excellent. Okay, excellent presentation. Uh, actually, uh, i like to know about, uh, uh, you know that uh, different uh, exposure level, and also uh, different kinds of the stresses, like both biological and bio biological and abiological stresses. Uh, that is uh, in the moment uh, is coming up, and certainly there is a change uh, due to uh, the climate stresses also. Uh, what what is the basic uh, impact uh, the biodegraders can say or bio 
monitoring devices in fact particularly uh, which can detect these emerging stresses uh, what is the role of japan and japan japanese are they doing something in this direction Oh, thank you very much, Doctor. Your question. So, could could you could you could you say your question again? The final part. Sorry, I I cannot he hear you clearly. Changing environment and uh, changing stresses. In fact, uh, there are a lot of changes are going on. A lot of emerging contaminants and uh, toxicants, uh, including the COVID-like situation, has emerged. So, is there any indicators, or you can say the more monitoring things, which can detect these kind of things in the true novel sense? So, you mean the monitoring the air condition, or monitoring the yeah. disease? Of yeah. Any any stresses? Uh, any any stresses? You can say the stresses in the sense maybe the biotic and abiotic in origin. The biotic may be the disease causing. Including the COVID is one of the best examples of this. Uh, the situation is that you know that uh, this may leads to the emergence of the DNA and RNA, including uh, that you can say. So how to detect it? Uh, the prior detection models or the modeling or such kind of things. So is there any devices for that one? The Japanese teams they have developed. Uh, they are doing in these directions. That I like. The India I am trying to use now. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Be your question is, I think, a very, very important part. So, um, actually, I'm working in the public health field. So, actually, in my slides, so I use the data uh, related to the health outcome. But also, you mentioned about uh, uh, some ecological, uh, how how we can monitor the ecological forest. So, this 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 part. I have to collaborate other researchers. So only my study field is not enough. So I have to make a collaboration network. Um, so some researchers already monitoring the uh, diversity, bio, biodiversity loss, and also the how much the, some species is uh, distinct or something like that. So. Each study field data we have to gather and then we have to evaluate from the total view of the uh, planetary health. So, actually, in Japan, so, uh, we have uh, uh, many, many types of the data related to the health because uh, we have a uh, health data, uh, large, um, large size of the health up data uh, but actually it's difficult to for me it's difficult to get the data about the biodiversity loss or something like so in this sure uh, i have to collaborate with other if i collaborate with other study researcher and then if i make the interdisciplinary research network so uh, we can use the many, many types of data. And then we can evaluate the many types of the health, not only health, uh, effect on the uh, Earth, a planet, uh, by the air pollution and climate change. Yeah, so your question point is very important in the planetary health approaches. Thank you. Sorry, Nitin, your microphone is mute. You're on mute. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Sami. And uh, as we do not have much time left, so we will be straight away going for a very brief uh, three minutes each or four minutes each uh, presentation, which is a pre recorded presentation. So, uh, 
for by the young scientists and I request all the panelists to be there for another 20 minutes or so and uh, uh, the evaluation sheets have been provided to you so kindly evaluate uh, these uh, students uh, as per the evaluation sheet criteria and uh, there are five uh, candidates and we have added one more candidate the number is 135 he will be presenting at last and his name is Mr. Amanuddin so the paper number is 135 hello everyone myself Mandeep Gupta and I will give a brief overview on seasonal trends in biosol load in different micro environments in IIT Kanpur. So, so biosol is So in another minute or so we will be starting. So. Dr. Nitin, just I want to mention that uh, Hello, I will have to leave. And I will give a brief overview on seasonal things in biology. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I understand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Myself, Amandeep Gupta, and I will give a brief overview on seasonal trends in biosol load in different micro environments in IIT Kanpur. So, biosols are suspended particles of biological origin in the air. They comprise of plants and animal debris, organic dust, fungal spores, bacteria, or their derivatives, metabolites like endotoxins, beta glucans, etc. Their exposure results in allergies, infections, and cause oxidative stress inside our body. Various occupational health hazards, which are associated with industries dealing with food processing, pharma, meat industries, hospitals, sewage treatment plants, etc. Apart from this, poor ventilation in buildings may lead to biosol accumulation, leading to sick building syndrome. So, a common threshold level has to be established since there is limited knowledge in epidemiology and lack of threshold exposure level. So, this field needs to be investigated. Now coming to metrology, impaction based sampling was done to measure viable fraction of biosols. The steps were involved, disinfection of complete facility, followed by biosol sampling, then incubating, and then colony counting, followed by morphological study. Here is the sampler which was involved in biosol sampling. This was developed and patented at IIT Kanpur. And this was the biosol samples developed before and after incubation. So here we can see mannitol salt agar base used for gram positive bacteria, baconki agar for gram negative bacteria and seborrheic gram phenicol agar for sampling fungi. Coming to results in discussion, as we can see from the box plot at the right side that lowest concentrations of biosol concentration was obtained in the months of uh, winter months from December to February and highest concentration was obtained in November and spring months. Also, we found that outdoor sites uh, have overall higher biosol load compared to indoor sites. Mainly fungal, main fungal genera found were Asparagus, Penicillium, and Cladosporium, while bacteria were dominated by Staphylococcus, Micrococcus, Staphylococcus, Bacillus, and Enterococcus, while gram negative bacteria were dominated by Pseudomonas, Aeromonas, and Enterobacteria. Uh, when we did statistical analysis, we found that there was no significant relationship between meteorological parameters and biosol and biosol concentration. Now coming to conclusion, this study lists a detailed overview of variable biosols in different microenvironments for a long period of six months. As discussed already, bacterial general of bacillus, staphylococcus, micrococcus, and staphylococcus were found. Among fungi, Aspergillus, Penicillium, Cladosporium, Fusarium, Rhizopus, and Muca were most common. Now, comparing indoor with outdoor sites at different microenvironments, we found fungal genera were mainly present outside and were at higher concentration, while bacterial load was high at indoor sites. Although average biosol load at all our sites were less than 800 colony forming units, which is suggested to be safe limit by Korean standards at public facilities. But this has to be further investigated. So future studies has to be planned in this field to establish a threshold exposure level along with epidemiological studies so that uh, more established literature can be done here and uh, more uh, definite studies can be uh, done in this direction. Thank you.
Thank you. We have uh, time for one or maximum two questions. So, any evaluator specifically wants to ask something? Uh, you told, Aman, you told that uh, uh, sir, sir, sir. something equipment is developed by uh, IIT? Yes, sir. Okay, what is the glory? Sir, you do it by lithium. And what is the area of uh, battery days or filter you are using? Uh, sir, uh, the filter paper was like 25 mm batteries. 25 mm? Yes, sir. Uh, Small. I think if it's 12 LP, 25 mm is alright? Yes, sir. Actually, the cutoff point was 0. 0.6 micro. So it was sampling about, about 0. 0.6 micro. Any international standard uh, meeting with this flow rate and size of sample? Uh, sir, uh, actually, this was uh, uh, this had been developed by our like previous colleague and the patent had been applied, so it is in process. But the uh, studies, they have uh, properly evaluated the cutoff diameter. Why you are doing this cutoff diameter? Sir, because like uh, its cutoff diameter is 0.6 micron. So this means that uh, all the particles above 0.6 micron, they would be captured and uh, below 0.6 micron, they would go with the air. So you are emitting filter or media? Sir, media. Cutoff diameter, we, like instead of filter, we have put petri dishes for yeah. infection. So all the particles above 0.6 micron, we are assuming that they would be deposited on other media, and uh, uh, below 0.6 micron particles would be uh, flow, would go with the stream. Okay. So and your patent is uh, in what stage? So it's in the process. Okay. Thank you. Hello. What? Are you using the filter paper? No. Sir. So, so how are you maintaining the particle size there? Man, actually, it's an impaction made technique. So, uh, what happens? So, uh, the cutoff diameter is the normal. Uh, uh, like the impaction, under impaction, we uh, the flow rate and cutoff diameter. We uh, we two measurements we have found that above point six micron, they are capturing the particles. Uh, we have confirmed it with particle size also. So it is a continuous analyzer. You are using it or a batch type? Sir, we do study for three minutes because after that it's coming to after that clusters uh, occur over the media. That's why we use it for batch like three minutes. It's not continuous. And and the study has been done in a closed indoor chamber, or it is done somewhere outside. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear you. And my study has been conducted in four different micro environments, and two were at two were outdoor sites and two were indoor sites. No, no, indoor means it whether it's a closed chamber because we need to have a controlled closed chamber for indoor studies. No, no, no. It's, it's have you generated indoor. the dust? Have you generated that dust, or it is an ambient no. dust? Maybe it was indoor ambient dust, not controlled chamber. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Aman. So we will move to the next paper number 83. Hello, all. Welcome to this work on the temporal trends and characterization of biomass burning in the Indo Gangetic Plains and the northeastern part of India with aid from satellite based observations. Air pollution is a cause of concern in the Indian subcontinent. A significant portion of that air pollution comes from biomass burning, which emits greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and methane. Satellite-based data provides information on the distribution of fires, form a significant component of the global warming studies. The croplands in the IGP are involved in the cultivation of crops like rice, wheat, maize, almost throughout the year. Whereas the northeastern part of India is distinguished by a heavy vegetation cover, which consists of the green as well as the forest. Either on the right, the yellow shaded part of the IG green shaded northwestern region, and this is our study area. We have used 10 years of daily active data from August from January 11 to December 2020, which has been analyzed for most years. Fires are captured in the form of pixels at one kilometer resolution. Yeah. Any online person is uh, having this microphone on? 
and limited of the study. Um, what we found was significantly different characteristics for both the region in terms of the FRP distribution month-wise. You can see the wheat cultivation period which occurs in May contributes almost 30% in the IGP, whereas almost 56% is coming during the paddy cultivation period, which is in October and November. You can see this figure. Whereas for the northeastern region, the figure to the right, it's almost a skewed distribution. You know, almost 71% fire radiative power is occurring during the March month only. Now, this month is characterized by a huge number of forest, forest fires which have been reported earlier as well and which can be possibly reasoned out to be the cause for this FRP distribution. So to sum it up, the IGP has intensive farming in the form of paddy and wheat, which eventually contribute to the crop residue burning in May as well as October and November. Whereas in the northeastern region, forest fires in March contribute to the enhanced fire levels. IGP has got anthropogenic fire emissions mostly, whereas NER has significantly natural origin of fires. Thank you all. Thank you for your patient listening. Our queries and questions are most welcome. Yeah, let's have a very brief uh, question and a straight answer if possible. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Can I ask some questions? Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, please go ahead with one question because we are short of time. Okay, actually, I just wanted to ask you because there are many sources which are burning, not only the uh, agriculture residue, there is a solid waste burning site, there is a crematoria emission. So, how are you dis distinguishing between these emissions? There are there. Right, right in NER region and IGP also. Yes, that's a valid question. Uh, it's a simple for qualitative analysis. As you can see, the seasonal distribution or the month wise distribution, those months or two seasons coincide with the agricultural residue burning in the IGP. Whereas for the NER, actually, residue crop, the major grown crop is rice. But uh, residue burning of rice or paddy doesn't occur in the northeastern region because they actually cut it manually. Whereas in the IGP, since the demands and demands are high and the supply is also high, so a large amount of uh, crops are there. So its mechanical harvesting gets placed in the IGP. Whereas in the NER, it's manual harvesting. So that is a re the residue uh, behind life in the case of IGP. So that is why agricultural residue burning has been classified qualitatively for the IGP, whereas for the northeastern region, based on the literature, because forest fires occur in the March due to high temperatures there, has been reported, and they coincide in our work with the increase in fires, open fires, which we have classified as forest fires. And the land cover usage, if you see on the land, uh, land cover, you see the heavy vegetation cover is there for the NER, and it's only in the March where, where the fire emissions are high. So it's a qualitative. Uh, this is actually part of the process, the initial stage, where we'll be uh, studying it on a post chemical level. Though we don't have that amount of spatial uh, logistics available in case of ground based studies, so that is why the satellite based study covers a lot of ground, whereas in case of ground based studies, when we do regional studies or hotspot study, we don't have that much of so we will we are going for a regional background station studies in that case. You have published this paper in 2016. Uh, I which, see the reference. Which one? The last slide showed showed a reference. It has a comparison uh, that 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 where we mentioned that forest fires have been reported. So the, uh, where we derived it. Okay. So it's a qualitative approach. For the quantitative approach, we are going for ground based study in the in that case for both regions. Okay. Thanks, Adnan. Have you done any emission inventory and modeling of this? No, not in this, uh, in this work, not in this work, no. Okay. Right, we have time to move to the next presentation. Uh, paper number 103 by Rohit Dara.
Hello everyone, I am Rohit Dalal from Energy and Resource Management Division, CSR near in Nagpur. On behalf of my team, today I will I'll be discussing about how an energy efficient hydrogen production method can be selected and at the same time how we can reduce the carbon footprint of such hydrogen production method. For this study, we have made a process simulation and made a comparative analysis for few hydrogen production methods. Currently, hydrogen is uh, produced from reforming of natural gas or methane. But these hydrogen production methods emit high amount of greenhouse gases. So major challenge exists to decarbonize such hydrogen production method as much as possible. With CCOS technology, that is carbon capture, utilization and storage technology, this hydrogen production, uh, the, the CO2 which will be emitted can be captured and utilized. So we have done uh, process simulation using DWC software for, for such hydrogen production methods using minimization of gives-free energy. Basis for doing op process optimization that we have considered are listed below. As you can see, the figure on the right indicates overall energy required, consumed, generated at different steps of the process. The novelty of the study uh, is such that we have coupled dry reforming with water gas shift reaction. Generally, uh, stream reforming goes with WGS reaction. But as we have coupled with dry reforming, also this will be a new aspect to the study. This figure indicates hydrogen production in kilomole per hour as well as hydrogen is to carbon, to carbon monoxide ratio for different cases of reforming. As you can see, we did, we did process simulation for different, uh, for different cases by changing uh, pressure as well as feed molar ratio and keeping the temperature constant. But only uh, base case scenarios indicating hydrogen production are uh, are shown in this figure. There are two aspects to conclude this study. First is overall energy consumption. For only reactions to occur, we know that DRM require more energy because of its uh, heat of reaction. But uh, if we ignore such heat of reaction, SRM requires a major amount of energy uh, more than DRM because it requires production of steam. So if you look to overall energy requirement of different processes, SRM obviously require more amount of energy than DRM. Also when coupled with WGS reaction. The second aspect will be hydrogen production rate. When we compared all the outcomes from the met all methods in terms of hydrogen production, DRM plus WGS can be preferred over other methods with net CO2 utilization as well as low energy consumption. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rohit, uh, have you under, uh, taken the risk that is associated with all these reforming cases? Hello, ma'am. Have you considered the risk associated with all these reforming cases? Uh, no, ma'am. It was just a theoretical study, uh, so we haven't considered that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not then we move to the next uh, paper, paper number one two one by Hemant Dharwani and Dhanya Balachandra. Welcome everyone. My name is Danya Vidhi. I am from CSIR Neri. I am here before you to present the topic value environmental externalities for the mitigation of climate change impacts and promoting sustainability. You know, environmental externalities are a much discussed topic till date. Any damage or depletion to the natural resource come under the category of environmental externalities. To showcase why their evaluation is so important and how they promote sustainable development, I have selected the depletion of urban green spaces as an evaluation parameter. We know urban green spaces exhibit a variety of ecosystem services and influences the climate condition in the nearby urban area. Hence, for the current research, I have selected Chandrapur city of Maharashtra state as my study area and the study period ranges from 1990 to 2020. 
The methodological part consists of two subsections, which are assessment of urban green spaces for Chandrapur city, which include the preparation of LULC and NDVI maps. And the second part is the monetary valuation of ecosystem services for the urban green spaces. These are the results obtained. We can see that from the analysis of NDVI and LULC map, a decline of 17.20 square kilometers of urban green space area has been occurred in the Chandrapur city over the study period. The second part of the methodological section is the monetary valuation of ecosystem services, which involve analysis of various research articles and the application of econometric tools like value transfer method to yield a unit monetary value of the ecosystem services. After that, this unit monetary value is applied to the depleted urban green spaces and it yielded an amount of 18.63 crores INR, that is the lowest functions of the depleted urban green spaces of Chandrapur city has a monetary worth of 18.63 crores, which is a huge loss. Hence, from this we can conclude that evaluation and assessment procedures are very vital for improving environmental quality and for sustainable development. It also helps the policy makers in decision making processes as well as brings a balance between ecology and economy. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Any question for the yeah. Hello Dhanya. Can I ask? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, uh, Thalia, have you done any uh, ground calibration study for assessment of your monetary value? Dr. Parma, just hold on. I think we need to get uh, Dhania connected. Just one second. Uh, okay, unfortunately, the candidate is not there connected, so we cannot take up this question. So possibly we will move to the next candidate, the paper number 122. Uh, Hibat Dharwani, yes. Amol Mubarakar. So Amol, please. Sir, uh, no, uh, I think there is a recorded message. Yes, yes. Yeah. Is it yours? I am Amol giving a presentation on monetary quantification and benefits mapping of mangroves of Andamans on behalf of Dr. Himan Pirawani, scientist CSLA. Mangroves are a form of salt and forest ecosystem from primarily in tropical and uh, subtropical regions of the world. It has a remarkable resistance to salt water. During the diet, they essentially form a complex network of open arterial roots. The mangrove ecosystem plays uh, an imp important role in uh, providing numerous ecosystem products and services that are uh, essential to the lives of uh, local communities. Mangroves are nowadays uh, deteriorating uh, ecosystem goods regeneration and protection for its uh, service through uh, payments or by any other uh, ways may significantly contribute to improved living, uh, climate mitigation and environmental transformation. In this paper, mapping and valuation of ecosystem and services of uh, mangroves in Andaman is uh, carried out to assess the alteration in ecosystem services due to the reduction of mangrove area in Andaman. The, the, economic, the economic assessment is also done for the use values and non use values of mangroves for, of uh, Andaman to preserve its natural ecosystem. In this study, remote sensing technology with the geographic information system, GIS, is used to analyze landsat images and to observe uh, changes in the mangroves area and other relevant land use land cover patterns. In the study area of Andaman Island, land use land covers analysis is carried out for studying environmental changes and their effects. Uh, economic valuation of ecosystem services of uh, mangroves of Andaman Island is done by different methods like uh, willingness to pay method, travel cost method, market price method, using the primary data collected from a questionnaire survey at selected sites and uh, secondary data assessed through differencing in GS. For the year 2018, mangrove uh, covers the island of Andaman by an area of 377 square kilometer occupying 8.04% of the total study area. An overall uh, reduction in mangrove area by 19.3% was observed from 1989 to 2018. Similarly, water bodies showing a reduction of 27% since 1989. A gradual reduction of nearly 42% was observed uh, in the Evergreen Forest since 1989. 
it can be observed that deciduous forest increases significantly from 938 square kilometer to 1894 square kilometer uh, settlements that include a built up agricultural land uh, open land uh, is also increased significantly from 447 square kilometer to 755 square kilometer the total economic value was estimated by uh, considering both use and non use values uh, of mangroves of andaman total economic value of andaman mangroves is, is estimated about uh, 47 million per year per square kilometer Views of Andaman Island provide a wide range of economic benefits, including jobs and income opportunities for the people of Andaman through recreational activities and tourism. In the past few decades, the number of mangroves in Andaman has dropped significantly. The protection of existing mangroves from the cutting and trespassing and thereby regenerating areas through the plantation of appropriate species of mangroves, including vulnerable and threatened species, appear to be an essential management option. Thank you. Thanks, Amoli. Good question. Any question for Amoli, sir? See, I would uh, request to have at least one question. If there are, yeah, for panelists, if there is any question, then we have some evaluation marks for the question answer. So, uh, can I ask? Yes, please. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> I have been asking so many questions. Good to you that you are asking. Yeah, thank you. Please go ahead. I actually just wanted to know whether the monetary evaluation for mangroves, uh, the, the data that is taken as a rate for monetary evaluation is Indian or it is taken from any foreign source? Amol? Amol, are you there? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, please respond to the question. Did you hear the question? Yes, sir. Ma'am, it's it's uh, taken from the Indian journals and reports uh, for the secondary data. And we collected the uh, secondary data from the uh, uh, government departments of Andaman. Uh, that is uh, traveling data and all this. Okay. Thank Any further question? If no, then we'll move to the last presentation. That's paper number 135. So those online evaluators, this paper was not there. Please include paper number 135. And the name of the uh, sort of candidate is Amanat Deen. So Amanat Deen, go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanuddin Azad, and currently I am working as a research scholar in CSI and National Environmental Engineering Research Institute. So the topic of my presentation is environmental impact of structural material by life cycle assessment analysis. These are the background and motivations of my studies. So LCA, LCA analysis, that is life cycle analysis, is the methodology or it is a tool which is used to evaluate the environmental potential of any product. This tool uh, includes the various stages and various frameworks of the studies. This this, this frameworks are gold and scope definition, inventory analysis, impact assessment, and the interpretations of the results. So these are the methodologies of my studies. We have developed the conventional previous concrete. As we know, the conventional uh, previous concrete is a mixture of the cement, coarse aggregate, and the water, with the eliminations of the fine aggregate. The proper utilization of the conventional previous concrete, which helps to minimize the storm, manage, storm water management. The design mix proportioning of conventional previous concrete were done as per the report of AC, ACI 522R and IS 10262. The, the physical properties of the conventional previous concrete is to be evaluated, like compressive strength, workability, density, and the void content is to be evaluated. So these are the result and discussion of my studies in that we evaluate the physicals and as well as the life cycle assessment properties of uh, conventional previous concrete. Um, from that result, we, uh, we, uh, we got the compressive strength up to 15.88 MPa with a density of 2140.44 kg per meter cube. Apart from this, uh, we have evaluated the life cycle assessment uh, by using the Gabi Pro software. From that, uh, we got 180.3 kg of CO2 emissions uh, for one meter cube of concrete. And uh, we can find that the maximum content, uh, maximum value has to be contained by the cement only. So, uh, 
so these are the conclusion of my study that we can conclude that the highest compression strength of the previous concrete was obtained 15.88 mpa uh, with the density and the void content of uh, 2140.44 and 16.59 percent it has been concluded that the carbon footprint of conventional previous concrete is high and the cement is the main material which is which causes the high environmental impact so the substitution the substitution of the cement with alternative bonding materials like ply ash and the slags has to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions from the atmosphere so so this is a brief presentation about my study thank you so much Thanks, uh, I'll take some questions. As you told, we have uh, heard some international uh, data based to calculate life cycle data results, right? Uh, so, how, uh, what do you think about the is applicability in Indian context. Can you hear me? Uh, hello, uh, pardon, sir. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, am I yeah, I'm here? Here, sir? Okay, the sir is asking. You have probably referred from uh, international database. How relevant is uh, NCA database in Indian context? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the software which we have, we have been used that is Gabi. It is it is indicated that any and uh, many of the Indian database has has been al already included in that uh, software. So we have only uh, we have taken only the Indian uh, Indian inventory that uh, which is already mentioned in that database. Okay. Any other question, please? Online evaluators, do you have any question for Amanuti? If no, thanks, uh, Amanuti. And uh, now we have come to the close of uh, this uh, presentation as well as the panel discussion. So I would like to uh, request Dr. Tialidas to please sum up and propose a uh, reduced vote of thank on behalf of the society and on behalf of uh, moderators of this session. Yeah, thank you, Dr. So uh, we have come to the end of our session. So and uh, first of all, uh, all the uh, panelists, um, uh, we really they need a like our must clap for them for having the spirit to stay for such a long period, which is really uncomfortable. So uh, thank you so much for your patience and for your wonderful contribution uh, towards this and. Uh, I think there is not a best time for this discussion, especially this session, just uh, within a month, uh, uh, just uh, like uh, after the COP26. And we know where we, uh, at this moment, uh, how is the situation if we look at the world. And uh, if we look at the uh, commitment in the, like, you know, Paris, what we, uh, we are far away from that, uh, reaching that. So uh, now the time is uh, running very fast. So if we look at the COP26, actually, uh, uh, if we look those uh, uh, like the commitments, especially if I can mention the, from the what India has made the commitment, some really needs, uh, like the, we all have to act. There is very little time uh, to uh, wait and act. So towards that, like one of the uh, main points what India, I would like to major uh, commitment India has done so, which uh, really require very strong uh, domestic uh, policies actually to give that. So, uh, that is one of that is that India will need 50% of its energy with renewable by 2030. And uh, there was uh, definitely very big uh, like new target for uh, 2030, like you know, about 500 gigawatt uh, energy from renewables. And then India will reduce its total uh, projected carbon emission by 1 billion tons from today, uh, from now to 2030. So when, uh, like uh, before uh, this session started, um, uh, really we wanted to look uh, or hear from some of the brilliant minds. I mean, our speakers are from different age groups, from different, uh, like a very complementary kind of background they are coming from. 
So one of these points that India will reduce this projected emission by 1 billion tons from now to 2030. So we wanted to get some answer, like you know, some how we can really uh, move towards that, achieving that. So I must say that uh, uh, from all of you, uh, uh, actually given some of the very good uh, recommendations or points, uh, which uh, we definitely will uh, meet uh, after this uh, session, and which will be very helpful in uh, having uh, making the roadmap for India. So, if I go just one liner from uh, for every um, panelist. So, first, uh, our first panelist was Dr. Rakesh Kumar. He has a very vast uh, expertise. Uh, so, uh, what I could pick up from his presentation that he wanted to talk about a very holistic uh, approach and not in, a, in silos uh, to see the uh, challenges. So he talks about basically climate change, health and water mixes. Overall, he also indicated that we must not neglect the, uh, the ozone concentration, which so far is not being uh, much uh, like you no know, focus. Then he talked about another very important point that top global brands uh, in terms of the impact that livelihood is in the end. From India's perspective, we strongly recommended to bring it up and in the, at the top. And at the end, uh, just I want to talk about many other very important points which we will be submitting. So, um, uh, one point I said that I, when I was listening to him, I remember that Mahatma Gandhi's, uh, that Sarvadaya and Antadaya, that concept, that until an only country, that uh, like, no, it is that benefit of any policy, benefit of any act, reach to the poorest of you, the poor, the, like, no, um, uh, the person who is in the, at the bottom, that Antadaya we don't do, so then there is no benefit to the country itself. I think he spoke about in a way that, uh, like, no, we should not hit the poorest of poor in terms of making recommendations and all, but we have to take care of, uh, like, no, think of the solution. Now, when coming to Dr. Saudi Ashima, she spoke about a very important uh, aspect of planetary health approach. And I think what she said that she is willing to work with India because uh, she said there are top five or six Asian countries uh, which has uh, like no show very critical data at this moment. So and India is not doing much in this, and we definitely uh, like no welcome and uh, you uh, we look forward to this Indo-Japan work in this uh, area, and uh, it will be very beneficial. Then moving to Dr. Sumit Sharma, and he is also having a very rich experience uh, uh, in this uh, field and he talked about uh, overall air pollution in India and uh, most importantly what is uh, for everyone, I think, I think everybody should be aware of this, that work on that uh, inventories in national scale, what they have worked in and um, it's a very important uh, inventory and uh, and thank you Dr. Sumit for your that uh, recommendations and uh, that was very, very important recommendations and uh, I really appreciate you uh, this uh, insightful lecture. Then moving to Mrs. Uh, Padma is now and I must, first of all I must say that your enthusiasm which has touched me like and uh, uh, so even uh, like you know, at the, I mean I started with that you just underwent some subject but I think you are the most enthusiastic <coughs> so person so it made our uh, uh, like you know, even the student evaluation uh, so I thanks for that and very important point which uh, is a takeaway point from this that that dangerous imbalance of that buffer to core area. I think this is a very very important point you have uh, raised and uh, this needs to be really uh, looked upon uh, when we are uh, like, you know, uh, talking about national level programs and all and then identifying the hotspot and how we can really uh, then and there actually in that uh, localized uh, that areas we can deal with that uh, like my mission so that it don't get spread over that and many other points uh, like we have shared. So thank you for that, very uh, insightful. Then uh, Dr. Altaf Khan, so you also and that again, as I said, all our panelists were very complimenting. So it was once uh, you talked about that uh, quality standards for this, uh, like especially for the indoor air pollution, which is uh, neglected so far in our uh, policies. So that is a very uh, pertinent, I think, uh, like new questions you have raised. And uh, finally, uh, moving to our, again, uh, the last panelist, uh, but not the least, and very young panelist, that is uh, Ninish uh, uh, Singh, Mr. Ninish Singh, you talked about 
uh, acid cities uh, that is short lived climate uh, pollutants which also is a very like you, know, you have uh, spoken about the very uh, like you no know, uh, need of the hour actually it has to be also integrated uh, or embedded in the like you no know, policy uh, uh, planning and all so with this all and i also thank you um, uh, all the um, audience who has um, shown your interest and asked questions and made this session a very lively session and with uh, thanking also my uh, the chair of the session and with this we we'll close this session and thank you all and especially the speakers and all the behind the scene uh, workers and you have done excellent and thank you so much with this we we'll close the session thank you thank you thank you uh, dr priyali das and uh, dr nidin lakshwar for moderating this session now we are going to the further proceedings of this session uh, i request uh, dr ashok pandey to come forward to give the momento to the panelists i request uh, dr nitin lakshwar to Then I request uh, Dr. Piyari Das to come forward. session is in sapphire who was physically present for it is remember yeah remember on ground floor please join us thank you okay it is for guys